So there's been a lot of stuff in the media over the last couple of years about these things called gravitational waves. So we should probably chat about them a little bit. Right. So we're going to have to start with Einstein and start with his general theory of relativity. So this is his idea about how gravity works. And the short story is that you need to he Einstein said we need to start thinking of space and time not as two separate things space is just being like the floorboards of of the universe that just sit there but actually there's this unified thing called space time and then what gravity is is that matter and energy when you put them in space time will make it uh, bend and contort it can expand uh, in in and change in various ways and the advantage of this idea is that uh, if you make gravity just a change in the very geometry of space and time it explains some stuff about gravity that were otherwise a bit confusing like why is it that two uh as as galileo supposedly did you get two uh shots you get a very uh heavy one a very light one you drop them off the leaning tower of pisa supposedly and they hit the ground at the same time well in einstein's theory the way that works is that um uh, they're both following a straight line through a bendy space time. Mm-hmm. And because they're both following a straight line, they follow the same straight line or parallel ones. And so they hit the ground at the same time. So you get a very natural explanation for this. Yeah. But the price to be paid is, if you want to put it that way, you have a theory in which space and time themselves are bendy. Yeah, yeah. And we have mm-hmm. to try and understand that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So um, it was Einstein that basically uh, started this notion of gravitational waves. And the, uh, the question essentially he asked himself is, what would happen if we could put a pinch into space-time? Imagine that you take space and time and you pinch it. Now, of course, we what we mean is we know what to do with the mathematics. We can put a little dent mm. into space-time, right? And then ask, well, what happens to that dent? And there's a few things that could happen. Of course, is you could put a dent into space-time and it just sits there for eternity, mm-hmm. right? Which is pretty boring. Or you could put a dent into space-time and it sort of just flattens itself back out again, you know, nice and gently sort of diffuses away, which again, isn't very interesting. Mm-hmm. What Einstein was able to show is that if you put a small dent into, uh, into space-time, it, yes, the dent sort of does disappear, but in, in, um, in responding, the actual space-time itself starts to vibrate, mm-hmm. and that dent itself is carried away in these vibrations in space-time. Mm-hmm. And this is what these notions of gravitational waves are. But Einstein had a bit of an interesting uh, history with this particular argument. He went back and forth about whether it was real or not, these, these vibrations. Yes, yes. I mean, there's a famous thing about Einstein saying that, you know, he, he, he was a great physicist, but he often struggled with the mathematics, right? Mm-hmm. So he did have some very, um, very uh, good fre- mathematical friends that mm-hmm. uh, uh, he could consult with. There's this issue in, um, in relativity in, in that you need to worry about your coordinate systems and mm. um as we uh, have, have chatted about previously right it a coordinate system is something we choose mm-hmm. and on the surface of the earth we p- can put down a coordinate system latitude and longitude all looks fine except at the north pole and yeah. the south pole right which is 90 degrees north but all of the longitudes are there yeah. so it seems to be something weird but if you stood at the north pole everything would be fine yeah in relativity, you have a similar thing. You, you have to lay down coordinates, and sometimes you see weird things because of your choice of coordinates rather than there some, actually being something weird there. Right. And this is what Einstein struggled with. He worried that gravitational waves were actually problems with the coordinate system, not actually physical things. Right. right. So the way you attack this is you need a physical experiment that you can really do, or you can at least imagine... That, that uh, turn, you know, in some way, you, you need some physics. Yeah. We need to get outside of our coordinate system and ask a physical question. So, what can we ask? Well, you know the you know the story of the sticky bead. I do know the story of the sticky bead. Would you like to? Tell- well, why not? So, um, I thought that this was due to Herman Bondi, but we've just looked it up, and uh, as you pointed out, uh, it, it's actually due to uh, Richard Feynman, as most things in the twentieth century physics are. Uh, but he did it anom- anonymously under the name Mister Smith. So, yeah, Feynman's everywhere. Anyway, Richard Feynman. So here's the experiment. Um, one of the ways you say, are these gravitational waves real? Is can I actually move some energy with them? Because if, if energy starts here and then there's a gravitational wave and then energy ends up over there, it seems like we've got something real. And so he, here's his experiment. Okay, we'll make some gravitational waves over here. We'll wobble space and time a bit. And then we'll put two sticky beads on a, on a pole over there on a rod with a bit of friction. And what we want to see is if 
if the beads start to move and the friction heats up the rod, then we've got something real, okay? So the, I move some things over here and then gravitational waves happen and then heat turned up over there. And if heat turns up over there, then you've really got something. And so you can sit down in your theory. A good, a good theory should always be able to say, if I do this experiment, what should I see? And so Feynman sat down and after him Bondi and did the calculation. And sure enough, yes, the beads move and the rod heats up. And so gravitational radiation must be really moving energy from here over to there. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually a pretty cool idea. You can actually do away with the beads in the end, right? Because what you could have is you could have the rod and as the gravitational wave comes through, the gravitational wave actually produces stresses and strains mm. in the rod itself, right? Mm. So you've got the atomic forces holding the atoms together, and you've got the gravitational wave coming through and trying to move the atoms apart. Mm -hmm. And so you end up putting friction in there. So as, as, you, as you said, you can transfer energy from one place to another, mm -hmm. uh, and that way you should be able to detect these gravitational waves. But of course, the first evidence for gravitational waves came not from a direct detection, mm -hmm. okay? So this is this famous experiment uh, done by Taylor and Hulse through mm -hmm. the 60s and into the 70s, I guess it was. Um, and they were looking at a pair of pulsars, so a pair of neutron stars. These are these uh, very dense remnants of, of dead stars, right? So they're very massive, very dense, lots of mass packed into a very small mm -hmm. amount of volume. If you're going to talk about the gravitational field due to these objects, you're going to need to use Einstein, right? Yeah. Gravity is strong. Newtonian gravity just doesn't capture any more. You need to worry about um, Einstein's general theory of relativity. So they have pairs of these pulsars, which basically they go beep. They go beep, 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 beep. So they're very regular clocks. And if you've got a pair of these guys orbiting one another, mm -hmm. you can actually measure their orbit very accurately from the way that their beeps change. Now, what they reasoned was the following, right? If these things are orbiting very close to each other and their gravitational fields are interacting, then their gravitational fields are actually setting up gravitational waves which are rippling away from these pair of pulsars. Mm -hmm. These gravitational waves are ra radiating away. They're carrying energy with them. So what's the source of that energy that they're carrying away? Mm -hmm. And it must be the orbital motion. So if you carry energy away, then that means that the orbits must be getting closer and closer together. And so what Taylor and Hulse were able to do was to show that the orbits of these pulsars were getting closer and if you calculate the rate at which they're getting closer and compare that to the expected rate that energy is carried away by gravitational waves, the two agree. Mm -hmm. So it's a non-direct detection of gravitational waves, but the, de the decrease in the orbit size is precisely what you'd expect from gravitational waves existing. So what we really want is that direct detection, though. And it's only in the last couple of years that we've got it, thanks to LIGO. So there was a time throughout the 80s and 90s when uh, there were a whole heap of experiments trying to see direct you know, if the gravitational waves were big enough, as it went past, you'd see a rod get bigger and smaller, but they're way too small for that. And so these were all sort of false starts. And uh, But uh, LIGO, in the last couple of years, has finally done it. And the way you do it is you have two four-kilometer-long uh, sort of arms of a what's called an interferometer. Basically, light goes out, light comes back. There's a mirror at the other end. You have two arms, okay, at right angles. And... Um, one of the things that we can do with light very accurately is interfere it with itself. So light beam comes this way, light beam comes that way. We put them on top of each other. And if the waves go together, then it will they'll double up. And if the waves go against each other, they'll die out. So we can see the way that they're interacting with each other. So here's what you do. Send light out to either to at the same time to both of these mirrors, have them come back, interfere with each other. If then a gravitational wave comes past, it's going to make one of the arms go a bit longer and the other arm go a bit shorter for a, for a very short period of time, for a very, sh very, very small distance. Um, it's, it's smaller than an atom. It's smaller than a proton. It's unbelievably small. The fact that we've done this is kind of amazing. But what's going to happen is one of those uh, light beams is going to come back a little bit later and the other one's going to come back a little bit sooner. And so the way that they interact with each other the way they interfere with each other is going to be changed and in particular uh, the way the signal we would expect if say two black holes were to coalesce with each other is very specific there's a burst of gravitational waves and so the way that these 
uh, rod, these, sorry, two arms will change, has a very distinctive signature. It's called a chirp. Um, and if we see that, then we think we're in business. And in particular, if we've got uh, a number of different uh, apparatuses, apparati, whatever. Telescopes. Like, they're telescopes. They're telescopes, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, we're astronomers. They're telescopes. Um, if you put them in a number of different places and a number of different things, them see the same thing, then you're in business, right? Because the arm will also be affected. It's so sensitive. If someone nearby sneezes, yep. then 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 it'll go. But you know, hopefully they don't sneeze in this black hole combining chirp-like fashion. And as long as you know, two people or three people in different places don't have this weird sneeze at exactly the same time, uh, then we can be pretty confident that we've seen uh, a real signature of a gravitational wave. Yep, and of course um, the. The famous event occurred in 2016, mm-hmm. and um, the the Nobel Prize was awarded for the detection of gravitational waves mm-hmm. uh, um, last year. Mm-hmm. So you know it, it it's definitely a, a vindication of Einstein's mm-hmm. ideas on the notion of gravity that we have these gravitational waves, and these gravitational waves can carry energy through the universe. Mm. I'm going to finish with something slightly controversial, though. <gasps> okay, right, um, right. that you get gravitational waves also in Newtonian theory. Interesting. Yes. So um, the way you can think about this is imagine that, again, you have a pair of objects orbiting each other in Newtonian gravity. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're orbiting away. um, And imagine you've got some distant objects in the universe. Those distant objects can feel the change in the gravitational field due to the fact that these guys are orbiting. Mm -hmm. Right. This change in the gravitational field actually influences the motion of these objects, okay? Now, of course, in Newtonian gravity, that effect is instantaneous, Mm -hmm. right? So they're not quite gravitational waves, but you do get a transfer of energy from these guys orbiting here to all of the other masses in the universe. And then conversely, as these masses move, they have an effect back on uh, these these guys that are orbiting. So there is something equivalent to gravitational waves in Newtonian theory. Mm-hmm. It does lead to an interesting question, though, and I think this um, uh, is going to be a tricky one, is that if you have a pair of these orbiting masses, imagine there's no other mass in the universe for them to interact with. Mm-hmm. Right? In Newtonian theory, then there's nothing for these guys to lose their energy to. Right. Okay. So if we've got a pair of objects orbiting in a universe described by Einstein's general theory of relativity and there's no other masses in the universe for them to interact with do they still emit gravitational waves well they, these get into some really sort of deep questions so einstein says there's this thing called you know wobbling space time okay is that a real thing Are we, do we want to in our idea of how the universe works do we want to pop that up in the category of that's a real thing in our picture of the way the world works or is that just some sort of computational thing that's going to help us work out how one uh, piece of matter affects another piece of matter. And so you might think that that, I mean, who cares, right? You, it, you don't really have to solve that question, but it, it, now it kind of matters, right? If you had to, uh, if the gravitational field isn't real, then it probably shouldn't be carrying any energy. And so actually two, uh, two pulsars in empty space wouldn't, um, gradually wind down and hit each other if the rest of the universe was empty. So these are some some very important questions about how we think about the way you know uh, gravity works. Yep. And as, as what we've seen, of course, is that what happened to the electric field and the magnetic field when we quantize it, and now we talk about individual photons, the mm-hmm. behavior is quite different to that classical idea. Maybe this uh, tells us that our quantum notion of how gravity operates is likely to be equally strange.